tea is a journey from the tea plantations to the barren plains, from the anticipation of tea to the production of tea. People journey ceaselessly in search of tradition, in search of antiquity, and in search of hope. At the end of the road, the sight of our homeland will comfort our hearts. From the tea plantations to the barren plains, roads have been developed because of tea. So many different ethnicities live on this vast land, their lives forever intertwined because of tea. In the Xinjiang area of Karakoram, a Uyghur man named Mijiti is heading to the summer pasture on the mountain. He is about to embark on an adventure. It's tough to get there. It takes three days by horse. This adventure might cost him his life. Sometimes when the river floods, we can't cross and we can't go back either. When the water level is shallow, the horses can just cross over the river. But when the water is high, we'll have to lead our horses through. Sometimes we can't cross at all. He is doing all of this for a type of tea. This tea has a lot of health benefits. It can reduce high blood pressure. If we have high blood pressure, drinking this tea can help us. It can even help to reduce fever. My wife has high blood pressure. That's how I heard about this tea. Mijiti lives in Keilangxiang, at the foot of the Karakoram. A few years ago, a new type of tea appeared on the Chinese tea market, the Kunlun Snow Chrysanthemum Tea. This tea is produced here. Xinjiang was never known to produce tea. Since antiquity, tea has always been imported into this region. But with the Kunlun Snow Chrysanthemum, Xinjiang finally has its own tea. Actually, the snow chrysanthemum isn't of the camellia genus. 
The tea it brews is bright red and smells of chrysanthemum. It tastes like black tea, and so it has been considered a type of tea leaf. The snow chrysanthemum that grows in Keliangxiang was actually transplanted here from wild chrysanthemums growing in the deep of the Karakoram. At first, people only appreciated its aesthetic qualities, but soon after, people discovered its value as a tea. It is now grown widely here. To help his wife with her high blood pressure, Majiti used to buy the snow chrysanthemums from his friends who grew it. This year, he has come up with a new idea. I should plant it myself. By planting the snow chrysanthemum, he could also bring in some money for his family, but the seeds alone would cost a quarter of his entire year's salary. There is only one way to save the money he would have spent on this. I asked a little yesterday. He told me there are snow chrysanthemums growing in the mountains. He told me to look for him the next time I graze my sheep. He knows where it is so we can go together. Majiti's plan to find the snow chrysanthemum is delayed because of aid. Aid is the most important holiday for Muslims. It is celebrated over three days, during which it is customary to visit family and friends and celebrate with joyous song and dance. I can sing and dance pretty well. Every time I hear the sound of drums, I don't feel like dancing. Besides herding sheep, singing and dancing are my two other passions. Recently, the Kunlun snow chrysanthemum tea has become integral to these celebrations. Mijiti has mixed feelings amidst the celebrations. He won't be able to spend the entirety of aid at home this year. He needs to set off to the Karakoram to graze his sheep in the summer pastures. More importantly, he hopes to find snow chrysanthemums on this trip. I've never seen wild snow chrysanthemums in the mountains before. But you never know. Maybe this time I will find some. But I heard that was where they were originally found. Kulangxiang is 2,000 meters above sea level. The summer pasture Majiti is heading to in the Karakoram is at 4,000 meters. If my horse slips, I will fall and die. Some of the mountain roads are very narrow. They can be hard for even donkeys to pass through, and they are strewn with rocks. That's why it takes so long to get there. We've all made plans in case one of us falls down. If one of us falls down, the rest of us will try to find a way to take his body back to his family. Majidi searches in the area where his friend saw the snow chrysanthemums. After a week, he still doesn't find anything. With the recent deterioration of the Karakoram pastures, many precious plants that used to grow here have disappeared. The shepherds pick the flowers while the sheep graze. 
Yet another week has gone by, but there is still no sign of the snow chrysanthemum. In a few days, I will follow a lipo up to the mountains. I'll keep on looking for the snow chrysanthemums there. Mijiti doesn't give up. There are 100 more days of shepherding ahead of him. There is a chance he might just see a snow chrysanthemum one of these days. If I can find the snow chrysanthemums up in the mountains, I will take their seeds back home with me. Hopefully, the seeds that I find will help my family. In China, Tea is a very inclusive concept. Many beverages made from chrysanthemum or other flowers, fruits, or Chinese herbs are seen as tea as long as they are brewed in the same way. They are tea, but not really tea in the botanical sense. These types of tea are usually drunk for their medicinal values. The herbal tea found in Guangdong is one such example. The speakers are a Cantonese rap band made up of non-professional musicians. The members in the band have their separate jobs, but they enjoy making upbeat rap music together. Because of their shared love for local culture, they have just written a new song about Cantonese herbal tea. Cantonese people love their herbal tea. It helps relieve the hot, humid weather in the south. Traditional herbal tea is made out of over 20 herbs and is brewed in a clay pot over a gentle fire. Strictly speaking, herbal tea belongs to the realm of medicine. When Cantonese people get headaches or a sore throat, herbal tea is their first remedy before visiting a doctor. The speakers have found another rap music enthusiast to shoot the music video for their new song. It seems a bit strange to see these flashy and modern young men rapping about herbal tea in front of an old school herbal tea shop. Heat, it's everywhere. Hey dude, herbal medicine is your friend. It's bitter, but it's good for you. It gets rid of all your toxins for you. It's magical, it's miraculous. It travels through my body in search of the meaning of life. I use pure herbs to quench my anger. The green genie will show me the way. From the outside, it looks like a bunch of youngsters putting on a show. But to these young people, this song is a search for their connection to the city. They're searching for the roots of their culture and the source of their tradition. Two thousand kilometers away, in Shishuangbana, Yunnan, tea drinkers here are still living according to ancient tradition. In a village located in Nanhua Mountain, Tudia is helping a friend with his wedding. Our entire village is one big family. When something happens in the village, everyone will help one another. We live together very happily. During the ceremony, offering tea is a very important ritual.
tea is even part of the dowry. According to the customs of the Hani people, when a woman gets married, she can never return to her family unless it is an important festival or something happens at home. This applies even if she's moving just 10 kilometers away. And so a big part of the Hani people's wedding ritual is crying. Chujia lives on the side of Nanua Mountain. He has a nine-year-old daughter. The most important thing in my life is my daughter. Besides that, I don't wish for anything else. We only got her 16 days after she was born. I didn't know it would be like that. When she was two, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. We didn't even think about it, about giving her away. That would have been worse for her. She only has one life. Chujia owns a 15-acre ancient tea forest. This is the source of income for his family of five. In Nanua Mountain, Chujia is a famous tea producer. Nobody makes tea by hand better than I do. In April every year, Menghai County organizes a tea competition. If Chujia wins this competition, he'll be even more famous than he currently is. This can help raise the price of his tea leaves. I'm making clothes for my husband. It's a special outfit for the tea competition. I do this for him every year. These tea competitions are held in all the major tea producing regions every year. The one held in Yunnan's Menghai County is especially competitive. The Blong people, Hani people, and the Lahu people who live here all claim to be the descendants of the spirit of tea, but there can be only one winner. A lot of people gather there to watch the show, including the media. It'll be great if I can win. His biggest competitor this year is Jia Del from the Blong tribe. He is the person that all young tea producers in Menghai look up to. Compared to him, Chidya isn't as popular. But he's been training for a year now. He's gunning for the title. If I win, things will change for me, definitely. But it isn't just me. I represent my village and the entire Nanua mountain. The competition begins. It is Jia Do's turn first. The competition doesn't last very long. Participants just need to finish making a Mao Cha. But handmade Mao Cha is one of the most difficult to make. Jia Do's performance is flawless. I was pretty stressed out. I had never been in that situation. I'd never made tea in front of so many people. It's all about the fire. You can hear it when you toss the leaves. You'll know if the fire's hot enough. True experts can feel the minute changes in the leaves while tossing them. The right time to finish the firing can be in a matter of seconds. 
I wasn't thinking of anything else, just about making a good batch of tea. I wanted the judges to like it. After the tea leaves are fired, they need to be massaged by hand. One needs to have strong hands to rub out the juice from the leaves. This seemingly repetitive action actually has many intricacies to it. This competition is about the synchronicity between the producer and his tea. The producer needs to truly understand tea in its minutest detail and be able to express it. Only then can one win the championship. I kept wondering if I got the prize or not. The results are announced that night. Chujia narrowly misses the championship. He comes in second out of a total of 20 participants. He almost took the first prize this year. But by all accounts, he still performed remarkably well. Chujia hopes to try again next year. By that time, his daughter will be one year older. I just want to be happy like this every day. That's all I can hope for. It's just my daughter I'm worried about. But even though she has this condition, we're still really happy. We're doing really well. I shouldn't think so much. I just hope that she can take care of herself when she grows up. I don't need anything else, just that. The most famous tea in Yunnan is Pu'er tea. The Maocha from the famous tea factories here will be pressed into cakes or bricks before being exported. These days, many people have come to love the weather taste of aged Pu'er tea. The journey to export the tea was long and dangerous in the past. Under the sweltering heat and the moisture of rain, the tea leaves began to oxidize and ferment, forming chemical compounds that are beneficial to the human body. The ancient tea horse road started from Yunnan and Sichuan. It mostly led to Tibet, where it continued through the valleys of the Himalayas on to India and Nepal. Horses were mostly used in the Yunnan part of the tea horse road. Whereas in the Sichuan part, men carried most of the goods on their backs. Since antiquity, the Tibeti has been made in Ya'an and transported to Kangding in the Tibetan region. The road in between is mountainous and steep. The only way the tea could be transported was on the backs of people. These people were known as tea carriers. I started carrying tea when I was a kid. I was only 13 when I started. I came from a poor family, and my parents were old and had weak legs. We were poor. We could carry anything. If you didn't rest, you could do five trips on one. Tea carriers worked on plantations during the planting season and carried tea during the off-season. A sack of tea weighs 10 kilograms, and a strong tea carrier could carry up to 16 sacks. I wore out a pair of shoes in just three or four days. When we wiped our sweat, we could hear the drops hit the ground when we flicked them away. It was a 20-day round trip. You got calluses on your shoulders. There were five or six women for every 30 people. Every 2.5 kilometers, we'd take a break. We'd rest the sacks on our canes. 
From Ya'an to Kangding, the journey takes more than two weeks. The tea carriers carried more than 300 kilograms along tiny, narrow paths. If they were not careful, they could easily fall into the ravine. I would spit in my hand, rub my hands together, and then rub my soul so that the blood could flow properly. Then I would start walking again. It was tough, but it was the only way. In the 1930s and 40s, there were 500 tea carriers coming out of Ya'an every day. Now most of these people have passed on, and much of that history has been lost. Most of my fellow tea carriers are long dead by now. I haven't walked this path in over 60 years. I'm the only female tea carrier still alive. Tea carrying used to be such an important factor in the ancient tea horse road. But now the trade has quietly disappeared. The tea carriers navigated one of the most treacherous tea routes in history with the most primitive means known to man. Like the Tibetan Plateau, tea was not originally found in the Mongolian Plateau. Meat and dairy products provided enough warmth for the Mongolians. But it was hard for them to get enough vitamins. The introduction of tea changed the nutrition intake of these nomadic peoples. The Mongolian people drink tea with milk, making this milk tea, known as sute tai, one of the symbols of Mongolian culture. When Bing Derry graduates from college, he wants to return to the Hulun Beer grassland to become a part-time shepherd. But these days, the traditional nomadic life in Hulun Beer is changing quickly. The new generation has mostly moved out of the grasslands and into the city. When I was going to college, I really missed the smells of home. In the mornings, my mum would make su tai chai with milk curds and beef jerky in it. I would drink two big bowls and herd the horses and sheep into the grasslands with my father. Those two bowls would fill my stomach for the entire day. When I get home at night, mum would already have made another big pot. In the grasslands, milk and meat provide energy to the shepherds. The tea provides the vitamins. The memories of Sute Tai and riding horses are woven into the blood of the Mongolians. Bing Derry can't be a shepherd yet. He hasn't learned the fundamental survival skill of the Mongolian people, horse muscle. The shepherds ride their horses in turn. Lassoing their horses keeps the horses from going wild. Horsemanship is important to Mongolian men, and they show off their prowess on horseback. Bing Derry needs to learn how to lasso horses. He decides to ask his brother-in-law for help. His sister lives near him. Every morning, she will wake up early and make a pot of hot su tai chai for her family. The tea comes from inland China. It is pressed into bricks so that it can be transported easily. The bricks are so hard that one needs a hammer to break them apart. The fragments from the brick are then put into a net and boiled in hot water. Fresh milk can be easily found in the grasslands. When the pot of tea water turns brown, milk is added. The white milk is mixed into the brown tea water. It is stirred and mixed together with the tea. 
until it becomes silky smooth and fragrant. On the table, Bing Dairy's sister has prepared cheese and milk curds. Bing Dairy's brother-in-law is teaching him how to lasso a horse. This requires cooperation. Someone needs to herd the horses, while another person waits with a lasso from the other direction. The rope needs to fall around the throat of the horse and tighten. If the rope falls around the horse's neck instead, it is impossible for anyone to draw the horse in. This is a battle of determination between man and horse. One of them will eventually admit defeat. Bing Derry's family makes a pot of sweet Su Tai Tai to congratulate him. Today, he has won the right to become a shepherd. More than 2,000 kilometers away, Zhang Hong Lai is searching for a wild tea tree in the virgin forests of Qishui, Guizhou. It basically grows on the cliffs in the virgin forests on either side of the Qishui River. I wake up at 4 or 5 in the morning. Then I go up the mountain and pick one or two sacks of tea leaves. I go back and forth until it is night time. Then I go home. Sometimes I wouldn't even come home until two days later. It smells really good. My mom has been making it for me since I was young. Zhang Honglai's 12-year-old daughter, Zhang Yun Zhao, is used to being alone at home. This tea that Zhang Yun Zhao has brewed is really rare. It is made using a special method passed down through the generations by the people of Qishui. The leaves that the villagers have picked are allowed to oxidize. This causes the leaves to emit a certain fragrance which attracts moths. The moths then lay eggs in the leaves. The larvae that hatch from these eggs eat the leaves. Their castings are dried and sieved. After some firing, it becomes one of the specialty teas of this region, worm tea. The castings from the worms add many nutrients to the tea that the tea leaves would not ordinarily have by themselves. Zhang Yunjiao's grandfather is 82 years old. He's always lived in the woods by the Qishui River. If you feel good, you should drink this tea. It'll be really healthy. You can eat the fresh leaves, the stems, even the branches. You can even eat the castings. We didn't used to be able to sell this. We would make it for ourselves. It's been around for a long time. This worm tea can help digestion. Actually, the scientific name of this tree is Litsea coreana. It isn't actually of the Camellia genus. The people of Qishui are in love with this tree, but this love is a result of centuries of natural selection. Because it is so hard to pick the leaves of this tree, the locals here use every single part of it. In the making of worm tea, they even use the tree branches. When made into a tea, it tastes sweet and fresh. <sighs> Pick 
picking the leaves of these trees has always been a dangerous job. Today, people still climb the trees in order to pick their leaves to make worm tea. Some farmers climb up with their bare hands, and sometimes they will fall. If I can do it myself, I will climb the tree. I don't want anyone else taking this risk for me. It can be as high as 50 to 60 meters. smells like the earth. Once it's been brewed, the tea is dark red in color, like black tea. This tea is a result of the meeting between man and nature. Drinking it, one can taste the humility and intelligence of our ancestors. On the 25th day of the 10th month of the Tibetan calendar, the monks in the Zandan Monastery in the western region of Tibet are holding the lamp lighting ritual to honor Jai Tsongkhapa, the founder of the Gelug school of Buddhism. All the monks in the monastery are required to gather in the main hall to chant the scriptures. Butter tea can ease the discomfort of dry throat and stimulate the senses. With the advent of modern technology, mechanical mixers are now used in Tibet to make butter tea. In the Zandan Monastery, the monks use an even bigger mixer to make butter tea for the monks. In the grasslands of Changtang in northern Tibet, 50-year-old Zhou Ma is fulfilling her greatest wish in life. I want to make a pilgrimage to Lhasa to pray to the Gautama Buddha. Accompanying Zhou Ma on her pilgrimage are her son and niece. Zhou Ma sets off in the cold of December. Tibetans prostrate themselves repeatedly on their pilgrimage. This requires the utmost stamina and will. Joma lives in Longren village, 200 kilometers from Lhasa. This means that they will have to prostrate themselves over 100,000 times. Drinking butter tea helps to replenish energy during breaks. But in the wild, Joma and her family don't have their tools to mix the butter into the tea. 
The only way to drink it is to drink the butter with the clear tea. It's important to drink tea during our breaks. It fills our stomachs and quenches our thirst. Tibetans are one of the biggest tea drinkers in the world. Butter tea is a part of their everyday lives. My mother is in a very good health, that's why I came with her. My health isn't good, so I can't walk far. Prostrating themselves every few steps, they can only cover seven to eight kilometers each day. They sleep in tents on their way there. Their tea wares are the few things they bring from home. When we drink butter tea during the day, we feel good even if we haven't eaten anything. One time, I broke three ribs and started bleeding internally. I pierced a hole in my body and drew out the blood with a pipe. I drew about three kilograms worth of blood. Since then, I've become very frail. One time during the pilgrimage, a strong wind almost blew us away. It was so hard to keep walking. My family told me that I'm too weak to get there. I said, forget it. Don't try to stop me. I have a lot of courage now. When I'm really tired, sometimes I don't even have the strength to lift the bowl of tea. In the high altitudes of Tibet, the air is very thin. Drinking butter tea can help to warm the body, fill the stomach, and provide essential nutrients. To the Tibetans, tea is the giver of life. Without a strainer, Joma and her family use a piece of thick paper to strain the tea. They will have to make do on this pilgrimage. My children were begging me not to go during the winter because of the cold. My mother is in a very good health. That's why I came with her. Before we left, my son said, Mom, you're so brave. I'll come with you so that I can help you. He was crying just now. He never talks back to me. He's always so good to me at home. As his mother, I can't be with him his entire life. Life is unpredictable, so let's go together. I don't know if we'll ever get there. One family, one car, one tent, and one cup of tea. All this for just one simple wish. Why are we doing this? We only have one wish. We are doing this for the world, to pray for health and happiness for the entire world, and to have our sins pardoned. I believe this is worth dying for. This is what I believe in. After a long journey, Joma finally arrives at the Holy Jokang Temple in Lhasa. Tibetans view life as a journey filled with perils. There are many hardships in life, 
and it is only through refining oneself that one is able to break free. Tea provides the comfort in their lives. It accompanies them through the trials and tribulations of life. It allows them to find the pure land in their souls. Tea binds the fate of the Chinese people together. The different ethnicities who live here, their different cultures, their different faiths. The purpose of tea is to blend things together. Tea and milk, tea and butter, tea and herbs, tea and flowers. Tea is the combination of man and nature. It is the combination of this land and life. For thousands of years, people in the East have discovered the meaning of life through a cup of tea. The Japanese tea ceremony had its origins in China. It preserves the values and mores of Eastern culture. Tea, the story of a leaf, episode three, making tea.